Welcome to the Jesus Church Podcast. We're a family seeking to become like Jesus, empowered by His presence, to partner in God's creative work of restoring the world. We pray this episode encourages and equips you along the journey. We're all in process, becoming something. Like a potter throwing clay or an artist mixing color, our lives are being formed. Different backgrounds and experiences blemished and cracked. Each day, an opportunity to move into or out of all that God has purposed. So the question isn't if we are becoming, but rather who are we becoming? And in this family, we want to go on the journey of becoming like Jesus. Well, good morning everyone, welcome. Really glad you're here. I'm Richard, one of the pastors here. Uh, If you haven't said hi, I'll be out there in the Connect space, love to say hi and get to know you. And uh, welcome back to the Becoming Like Jesus series. Last week was Pentecost, so we hit pause and we celebrated God sending his spirit and giving birth to the church, an awesome time. Um, And it actually really ties into today, uh, which is, you know, I, I was sort of thinking, man, If only we'd planned better, you know, we could have finished Luke, write a pen. No, but actually this is great. Um, And and we're back in Luke and we're picking it up uh, in chapter 22. So if you have a Bible, open there. We're going to read together. If you don't have a Bible uh, and you want to follow along, wave your hand in the air. Someone will hand you a Bible. If you don't have one, keep it. We'd love you to have a Bible so you can read. Um, And we're at this point where it's right at the sort of end of Jesus' ministry. He's in Jerusalem, conflict has escalated. Um, He's there with his disciples having these last moments and his death and betrayal is right around the corner. Um, It's gonna be a different tone uh, next week just to give you forewarning. Um, But Jesus, he has this beautiful moment of this last supper or communion with his disciples. And I'm really excited I get to talk to you about this uh, because it's one of my favorite things. Uh, It's actually, I think, my second favorite part of Luke. My my absolute favorite part of Luke is also in this chapter. So you've got to listen to the House of Learning podcast this week because Jesus interacting with Peter's denial, I think it's awesome. But but we're going to talk about communion. So that's an advert for that. And so let's read as Jesus institutes this new meal in Luke 22. And we're going to read verses 14 to 20. So when the hour came... Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for what you have done. And thank you for giving us your word because you want to impact us, you want to shape us, you want to form us with reality, with your truth, with your power. Lord, would you reveal your heart to us as we open your word and seek to align ourselves with the things that you show us. Amen. Okay, so Jesus institutes this new ritual, this new meal, and it goes by different names. We tend to say communion, Uh, In in this church, you could go to the church down the street, they might call it the Eucharist. You could go to the next church down the street, they might say the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper, and there's probably other names for it as well, but it's all the same thing. And it's happening as they are in Jerusalem at the time of Passover. And it's no accident that it's happening at Passover time, because what Jesus is doing is remaking, repurposing Passover, sort of leveling up to be a new thing. And the Passover was an annual meal, a feast, 
that the Israelites would celebrate together and it commemorated God freeing them from Egypt and bringing them out into freedom. The Exodus, where they moved from slavery and death into freedom and life. And one of the pivotal moments there is that a sacrificial lamb's blood is what enables the Israelites to be free from death. And God provides for them to actually get out of Egypt and move towards the things that he has for them. And the same themes are present in the communion meal. Uh, The sacrificial blood, present. Uh, A lamb is present. Remember when uh, John the Baptist saw Jesus rocking up to get baptized and he said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus is the lamb at the meal. Bread is in the meal. Uh, just like the manner of God's provision as how God provided for the Israelites as they exodused away from Egypt. And just like the Passover, it's a family meal eaten together. This was actually a stipulation of the Passover. It had to be done together with others in family. And like many of the feasts that God initiated for his people, they actually had this formative purpose They created these regular opportunities for people to come together, to gather in God's presence, to remember something and respond to it, to be shaped by it, and to realign their identity together en masse. And communion has the same purpose. And it's so important that it actually becomes one of the sort of four key planks of the early church. We read in Acts 2, uh, just describing like, okay, God's given birth to this church. We celebrated that last week. What are they doing? Well, these four things, it says in Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves, not occasionally did, but devoted themselves to these things, to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread is a sort of shorthand for communion, and to prayer. So it's one of these four key things. And Let's take a look at what Jesus says about this meal, because it's something we do regularly. We do it every Sunday. Some of you might do it in your community groups as well. You might do it like twice a week. Um, But it's something that it's really good to slow down and have a think about what we're doing, because there is so much richness to what God has laid before us at the table of communion. Uh, books, many books have been written about it, and we could do a whole series on it. But what we're going to do today is I'm going to try to uh, help us level up our understanding to enrich what we do. And then we're actually going to take more time to share and celebrate communion together. So the first thing Jesus says is, I have desired. The Greek actually says, I've desired with desire. It's, it's a way of just really emphasizing that Jesus has looked forward to this meal. And Jesus does look forward to this meal. He looks forward to sharing this meal with us. And not only that, Jesus says, I'm not going to celebrate Passover again until what this meal initiates is fulfilled. So this meal is a pledge by Jesus to have another meal. And every time we take it, we step into that pledge And we remind ourselves, we we situate ourselves one step further along on the journey towards that fulfillment meal. And Jesus talked about that in Luke 13, this great banquet when the kingdom is fully come, when Jesus returns, when God's work of restoration and renewal gets completed, there's a celebration meal. And so Jesus is in effect saying, hey, I'm starting something and I'm going to finish it. And so every time we take communion, we sort of need to remember Jesus saying, you're in the waiting, but I'm going to have that great banquet with you. I'm waiting, I'm desiring to have that great banquet with you. And so it's a simple meal, not complicated at all. It's got two two mouthfuls, okay? Two elements. So the first one is the bread. So let's just read what Jesus says. So he took the bread, He gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So bread symbolizes Jesus' own body, his life getting broken, his body being broken on the cross. It's a figure of his death on the cross. 
And not just that he died, but given for you. Jesus wants this to be personal. He wants us to understand that not only did he actually willingly, gladly give up his life, but he did it for you. He had you in mind. It's personal. And so as we interact with the bread, we're interacting with Jesus offering up his life to death for us. That's what we're receiving. And it refocuses us on the reality that because of Jesus' death, our old self, ruled by sin and death, has also been crucified. It's gone. It's been done away with. It's been buried. It is no more. We're, We're not that person anymore. And then we come to the cup. And Jesus said, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So the cup symbolizes Jesus' blood, which was shed on the cross. So this is definitely a cross-centric moment about Jesus' death. But also, this blood opens a new way. His blood paves the way for something new to happen. And so it's not just a, a, a scene of mourning at the cross, but a scene of realization that on the cross, Jesus is actually making something new happen. And that new thing is that new creation work, being a restored people, being a new creation, given birth to by the Spirit, by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead because his blood has made that way possible by forgiving our sins. And again, it's personal. This blood is poured out for you. It's not just poured out in general. And you know, if you happen to come up to the cross, maybe you can participate. No, no. Jesus is on the cross shedding his blood for you. It's personal. And it's blood of a covenant, blood of a new covenant. So covenant's this fancy word we don't really use in our culture very much. Um, but it would be a familiar word in the ancient Near East. And covenants were where God would speak his design into a relationship. He would speak his reality into a relationship. It would give it structure and depth. The covenants usually contained promises that gave people security about what God said he was going to go do, and obligations. And the obligations were God's directions about how to step into the blessing that came with what God said he was going to do. The obligations were not uh, what you had to do to merit inclusion in the covenant. The obligations were how to walk out the reality of the covenant. And those covenants, they provide belonging, security, safety, identity. They sort of make me think of adoption papers. You know, if you um, sort of had a young child that you kind kind of adopted, but not really, and they lived with you for years, and they became a part of your family. Like All the ingredients for belonging are there, but there's something different than when one day you come home, and at the dinner table, you slide a bit of crepe paper across the table and say, look what happened. Look, it's official. It's it's been rubber stamped. It's been made certain. Because when God speaks covenant reality into a relationship, he says, this is a thing. Like, I'm doing this. And so it raises the bar of hope and expectation. And it's a new covenant, okay? And these disciples listening to Jesus, their minds would have gone to Jeremiah 31. This is where this new covenant language comes from. And Jeremiah is this book where you've probably heard of Jeremiah be called the weeping prophet because it's right before the Israelites are about to be sent into exile because they've actually broken the covenant that God gave to Moses and the Israelites. But in the midst of that, God shares hope with Jeremiah that actually he is going to exodus them from exile back into blessing. And because of God's care and provision, redemption is going to happen again. That sorrow will be turned to joy. That mourning will be turned to gladness. But how? Like, how's God going to do it? Well, Jeremiah lays this out in verse 31 and 33. So, God says, the days are coming, 
declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. This is the new covenant. God's promise, God's intention to redeem his people in a way that he actually steps into their mind, their heart, to actually do the work of creating them to be the covenant people that God wants them to be. It's different to the old covenant God gave with Moses, but it's, it's not different in the way where God was like, ah, did I scrap that? That was a terrible idea. Let's try something different. This is like the fulfillment. It's like the graduation of that covenant because that covenant had all the ingredients of God's promises and what it meant to then align yourself and follow the direction of promise. But there was this brokenness, this love of sin, this fear of death in the human heart that got in the way of keeping the covenant. And God says, it needs more. And that's what God does in Jesus and by sending the Spirit. This is the connection to Pentecost. Okay, one of the things that Jesus says the Spirit does, he says the Spirit will guide you into all truth. And sometimes our mind there goes to like, okay, you know, so I want to know what's true and what's false. The Spirit will show me what the true things are. Yep, that's definitely a thing the Spirit does. But actually, it's more than that. It's that the Spirit will actually guide you, shepherd you, form you, shape you into people who have been shaped by truth. He will write his laws on your heart. He will be in your mind and heart, making you the new covenant people. So this is a beautiful connection to what we actually celebrated last week with Pentecost. Okay, so how do we do communion? If that's the sort of essence of communion. Jesus had these regular steps and these steps were so recognizable that even after his resurrection, when Jesus broke bread with some disciples who didn't quite know what was going on, they had this moment of like, oh, you're Jesus. So there's something, sort of a pattern that Jesus was building here. Uh, he did it when uh, he fed the 5,000. He did it several times with the disciples all the way through. And there's these four key steps. He took the bread and the cup. At the Passover meal, the head of the household, the father, would be the one sort of superintending the meal, distributing the elements of the Passover meal. Jesus situates himself as the one providing and giving this meal. Jesus is the source of this meal. He actually wants to interact with us as the provider that we actually receive it from his hand. And then he gives thanks. Uh, this is actually where we get that term Eucharist. It, it's just a transliteration of the Greek Eucharistia, which is the, the word for giving thanks that we have here. It's about blessing. This meal is a meal where we're supposed to be confronted by the reality of blessing and participate in blessing. So Jesus is the source, providing, giving to us so we can participate in blessing. And then... He divides, and this is actually unusual because in the Passover, normally people had their own stuff, uh, just like the way we eat, uh, with, you know, like Joey doesn't share fries, you know, we don't just eat off each other's plates. Uh, so Jesus does something a little bit unusual here, um, and one gets distributed to many, and this is actually profoundly important. Uh, Paul brings this up in 1 Corinthians. Uh, the Corinthian church had a real problem with disunity. And Paul used communion to help them understand the unity they actually had. He said this, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share in one loaf. So the oneness getting distributed among many actually reveals to us, shows us that we are one in Jesus. So there's this vertical aspect to communion, like us and God interacting. But there's also this horizontal aspect. 
that we do it as a family. We do it as the people of God together. We celebrate our familiness when we celebrate communion. We, we celebrate a shared identity. And we do so by coming to the foot of, of the cross. Like what a beautiful and profound way for God to actually level the playing field, get us all on the same place so that the work of loving one another and being united can move forward. Like such a powerful thing. And then the last action is to take. We receive. We receive from Jesus what he offers us. Communion involves an action of receiving, an act of receiving. Uh, John 6, where uh, Jesus is talking about his body and his blood and he's sort of pointing forward to, to this communion meal, he uh, reveals some ingredients of how to take that are really useful, connecting to the body and the blood. In John 6, 35, Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. Okay, catch this. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. There's some sort of connection between coming to Jesus around the bread and believing in him around the blood. We come to Jesus, like his body, the reality of his body broken for us. We draw near, we come to the foot of the cross. We draw near to that Jesus. And he's pouring out this blood of a new covenant, of new promise, of new identity, of new hope. And we believe. We entrust ourselves to the things Jesus says he's gonna do, to what he says he's about. We drink in our new identity. So I wanna talk a bit more about the practicalities at this point because they were Jesus' practicalities. What about ours, okay? With all this talk of a, a, a richly interactive experience of a meal, what's the deal with the little, actually, could you pass me one? Like the little teeny tiny cups that we have. Like, what's the deal with this, all right? This, this, just, this does not make me feel rich and highly interactive, um, you know? I, I was tempted this morning to bake a huge loaf of bread and have like a giant cup, okay? But can you imagine? It would have taken 45 minutes just to distribute the bread. I mean, it would have been awesome, but completely impractical, okay? We would have done nothing else today. Does it matter, okay? Because I know we're, we're an aesthetically sensitive generation. The fact that this isn't a loaf of bread, it does matter to us. But does it really matter? Does it matter to Jesus? Well, the bread and the cup are signs. They're signs, they're covenant signs. They get to do their job when they can function as symbols. Now, I love when we get to take more time. Okay, we, I think we've done it sometimes at a seek night. We've done it in community. Uh, we've done it with the young adults community before. Um, it, it's an, an awesome thing to do. But this being different, this being like a smaller petite version of a meal, it doesn't prevent me interacting with the symbols. These things, like them being symbols I interact with is about how I take them. It's nothing to do with the essence of what they are. It could be a crumb. It doesn't matter. It could be the worst tasting juice in the world. It doesn't matter. It's about what they symbolize to me and how I interact with that. Because the richness comes from the reality they point to. It's not actually about bread and about a cup. It's about interacting with Jesus facilitated by symbols. It could be a can of soda and a tube of Pringles. Okay? as long as it's fulfilling a symbolic function as I take communion. And honestly, there's a balance of communion fitting in as one of these four key practices that we want to do as a church it, as part of like the life and rhythms of what we do together. And the early church faced this. It's really interesting to read like the really early church fathers. They bumped into all of these uh, sort of practical problems of like, well, how do we do that? Now our circumstances have changed. And so we do communion in a way that fits our circumstances. 
And that's fine. We give up a little bit of like doing a longer version of it to be able to do it regularly. And that's awesome. But it's not the only way we do it. This is why it's so awesome in community groups to be able to take communion together. Because that's a space where you can slow down. You can do things a little differently. Maybe you can do it in a way that you include the kids um, or take more time to reflect and celebrate together. Each version has its place. Okay? Each has its impact. And I love that some technical wizard invented these because it enables us to do something that loads of other churches before us didn't get to do. So I'm thankful. Okay, let's get back to Luke. I don't, I, I had, that was like the, we had to talk about this before we took this. So I want to get back to a couple of important ideas we haven't talked about. Each time Jesus talked there about the elements, about the bread and the cup, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Really important words. What did he mean? Well, it's not so you don't forget me, okay? And, and neither is it like wearing a poppy on poppy day to remember fallen soldiers, like to, to honor Jesus. The disciples' understanding of remember would have been shaped by the first century practices of the Passover. And thankfully, the rabbis wrote it down for us. So we get insight into what Jesus was actually alluding to with these words. Check this out from the Mishnah. This is what uh, Peter and John and all the disciples would have had ingrained in them growing up around the Passover. It says this, in every generation, a man must so regard himself as if he came forth himself out of Egypt. At the Passover, they're sort of acting out this tangible, symbolic meal that represents the Exodus happening. But they're not just remembering like, oh yeah, that thing happened way back there. They're actually carrying themselves back to those events and allowing those events to affect them as if they were the ones caught in Egypt, as if they were the ones who've experienced being brought from slavery to freedom, from death to life. Communion is a, an act of holy storytelling where we situate ourselves back at the foot of the cross, where we can observe Jesus pouring out his life for us, to interact with it in a fresh way, to be shaped by it in a new way. Jesus is inviting us to sort of draw close, to close the gap between us and him so he can interact with us more richly. So how do we, how do we step into that? How do we do that well? Well, Paul, talking to the Corinthians, loads of insight about communion because the Corinthians were blowing it. So Paul had to say a lot of things to be like, this is how you do it right. This is how you do it right. So thank you for the Corinthians. That gives us the insight on how to do it right. Uh, and Paul brought up this idea of examining ourselves and discerning the body and bloody of, uh, the body and blood. It was a bloody body, but I meant the body and blood <laughs> of Jesus, uh, locking on to the reality. Uh, he said this in 1 Corinthians 11. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. So what sort of examine? Now, there's a really good version of this, but unfortunately, in loads of traditions in the church, this has turned into a, you know, confess your sins, get yourself right, so that you can then come to communion clean, like some sort of religious pre-wash, okay? No, that the whole point of journeying to the cross is that it's the one place you can bring your sin to get it dealt with. It's the one safe place to come and confess. It, it, it invites confession, being at the cross, but confession isn't a precondition of coming. It's actually being in the presence of Jesus on the cross that we realize the nature of confession and are able to do it well. The, the examining ourselves that we need to do is to bring the real us, to situate our whole selves at the cross, not just to bring a part of us. You, you've got to bring your true self to communion. 
See, the Corinthians, they were kind of going through the motions, but not being formed by communion. There was a, they, they had this divided life. Like there was a whole bunch of junk and they sort of felt like they could ignore that and still do communion in a way that it was still communion. And, and Paul called them on it. It's like, no, you can't bring the Sunday version of yourself and leave the rest behind and think you're still doing communion. That's tragic. Like the rest of your life is stuck outside and actually needs Jesus' touch and it's, it's creating a stink. And it's causing some of you to get sick. And the irony is that confession is a great tool for enabling us to bring our whole self to Jesus. That's one of the powerful things. We sort of think of confession as like, you know, if I get on my knees and say sorry in a heartfelt enough way, if I express that I'm sorry enough, maybe I'll somehow earn that sense of God forgiving me. But that's not what the power of confession is. That's just broken human relationships. That's what we do with each other because we don't really understand how fully to love each other. But God fully loves us. Actual confession in the presence of God is where we get to come in safety and actually just offer our whole self to Jesus, knowing that he loves us and he will deal with all the junk that we open out in our hands towards him and gently perfectly, powerfully. Confession is, is not a precondition, but it's something we do to make ourselves vulnerable, to expose ourselves. In the sort of garden sense of Genesis 3, to get out from hiding behind the bush and spend time with our Father who loves us. And I wanna, I wanna finish by picking up this theme of Jesus wanting to actually get the real us and interact with us. That communion is a moment of interaction. God does this a lot. He does a lot of things to help us interact with him. All those Old Testament feasts are examples. All the architecture of the temple and the tabernacle, all the symbolism. Baptism is another one. We're gonna do baptism today. In baptism, we act out a spiritual reality. We act out our old self being dead, and buried and gone because of Jesus' death. And we don't leave you in the water. We act out rebirth as a new creation in Jesus, a new identity. We make that reality more tangible to ourselves so God can interact with us more richly around it, to put a stake in the ground, to experience God through tangible things because God in his grace knows we are physical, tangible, embodied beings. He reaches out to our way of experiencing the world to interact with us. And Jesus is doing the same thing with communion. He actually wants something really rich. Again, in 1 Corinthians, Paul puts it this way. It's so important. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, it's not the cup of thanksgiving, the Eucharistic cup, for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ. And it's not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. The word participation here is koinonia. It's a word that we often, uh, we, we translate as fellowship. And it, it's kind of a shame because this word koinonia has come to mean uh, hanging out with Christians. But the word is so much more powerful than that. Koinonia describes lives that are being lived in a way that they're interpenetrating, becoming dependent on each other, where the boundaries are being brought down and life is being joined up, where union is being created. That's what koinonia pictures. It's like the best possible version we can imagine of what we mean by real Jesus community. It's creating family. And that is the aim of communion, that we would koinonia with the body and blood of Jesus, with his self, with his presence. Because Jesus, the source, he's presenting himself to us in communion to be received. Not just the fact that he died, not just remembering the idea, but his very self, his presence, doing the offering, the cleansing, the providing, the loving. And if we'll do what John 6 said, if we will come to Jesus and believe, 
and bring our true self, we will discover that communion is holy ground on which we can say Jesus is here. Because that is what God wants. He wants to be with us. It's what he designed us for. So what we're going to do now, I don't want to explain it anymore. We're going to learn by doing it and taking our time to do it. And so would you stand with me? We are, we're going to do it slightly differently. So I know some of you, you've got the habit of like, okay, I do this, then I do this. We're just going to slow down, take space to reflect, to pray, to pray with each other, take a little bit more time over the bread and reflect on it before we move on to the cup and have a bit more space to, to worship and just drink in God presenting himself to us. So let's just begin closing our eyes, opening our hands to Jesus. If you find posturing your body is useful, you could even kneel. We just pause, Jesus, to acknowledge you. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to reveal Jesus to us, to reveal the Father's heart to us. We invite your power to lead us into your truth. And like Jesus did, I want to begin with that prayer of blessing. Jesus, thank you for what you have done. Thank you for giving us this meal. You have tried to make it easier for us to interact with you, to remember you. You said, do it as often as you drink and eat. You desired this and you want to do it regularly with us. Thank you that your desire is to interact with us. And thank you for giving up your life, that you love us, that you are the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, I wanna take, this might be for some of you an awkward couple of minutes. We're going to take some time to examine ourselves. So I just want to pray over us. Jesus, you know us better than we know ourselves. Spirit, would you guide us into your presence as we approach you and the cross? Jesus, is is there some part of us where we've kind of got our body turned? Like I'll bring myself, but I kind of want to keep this part behind that you actually want to put your finger on and say, it's okay. You can just be you and come as you because I actually want you to bring your whole self into my presence. Lord, would you reveal anything where sort of hiding, anything we're ashamed of, anything you actually want to breathe the safety of vulnerability over that we might step fully into your presence. Jesus, is there any truth you want to speak over us? Anything you want to remind us of things you've done in our lives that will help dispel any lies we have that keep us at a distance from you? That we invite you to examine our hearts and our minds. So we're going to remember Jesus' body. So if you want to pick up the cup, you're going to be holding this bread for a little while, but that's okay. 
can take out the bread. What we're going to do is I'm going to pray a blessing over the bread. I'm going to give us a little space to just reflect and drink in the things Jesus wants to show us. And then we're going to turn with the people around us and have a little bit of space to reflect and pray together before we take it. So Jesus, I thank you for your body. Thank you that you love us so much that you would die for us. And not just any death, but a tragic death of betrayal and pain and shame because those are the things that you are crucifying so that they don't have to be ours anymore. All those things that harm us, you are killing. You are saying, no, that is not for you. Jesus, thank you for being our sacrifice. Lord, reveal yourself to us in your death. Okay, I want to invite you to just circle up with a few people and I'll, uh, I'll tell us when to take the bread. Let's just take a minute Just speak out those kind of one sentence prayers to acknowledge, because this is a Thanksgiving meal, to acknowledge your thanks for Jesus' body and the things he's showing you today about his body. So go ahead, circle up, share those prayers together of Thanksgiving. This is where we should have had the band. Okay. And this is where we get to express that action of receiving. And we get to speak over each other, God offering this to us, and then receive it. And so let's say these words over each other together like we do every Sunday. It's part of our regular practice. This is Christ's body given for you. And then receive it together. Thank you, Jesus. And we're going to move on to the cup. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to pray a prayer of thanksgiving and blessing over the cup. Jesus, thank you for your blood shed. You gave up life so that we would not have death as our destiny. And Not only does your blood poured out to us, given to us, offered to us, help us understand we don't need to fear death anymore, but you have blessed us with new life, with your life. You sent your spirit to create your new life in us. Like Paul said in Galatians, Christ is being formed in us and it's because of your blood because of the cross. You dealt with everything that was in the way so that you could new covenant us, so that you could new creation our mind, new creation our heart. Thank you for this cup. Thank you for offering us so much. Everything, every good thing, every blessing, every fruit of the Spirit, 
Lord, it's all provided by you. We thank you, Jesus. Just show us more of what your blood means to us today. Okay, I'm gonna invite you in your groups again. Just let's have a minute to pray those thank you prayers, to express to God with our family the things we're thankful for about him giving up this blood to new covenant. Go ahead. And again, we're going to use those words we say every Sunday to, to act with each other. Jesus offering us his very blood personally and then receive it. Take the action of receiving. So let's say these words together over each other. This is Christ's blood poured out for you. So Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your cross. Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for giving us this space to celebrate you and your desire to celebrate with us. Thanks for listening. For more resources and to partner with us through giving, visit us at jesuschurch.org.